Anything is possible. New freezer, it's a lot of them. Ashley. We made it. We made it. How are you? I'm wonderful. How are you? I'm great. Thank you again for making the time. I know how crazy it is right now, so I really appreciate it. No, thank you for having me. So excited to chat. Let's do it. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. We where made it. Where we did. I look at you. <laughs> yeah. Tech savvy over here. I'm 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 impressed. I know. Um, I'm in Florida right now, actually. What what are you doing out in Florida? Uh I am visiting with my fiance's parents. We, uh, Chicago, there was a, a ton of rioting right in my neighborhood earlier in the week. And so um, we, were, we were planning to come down here anyway. So we, we just made the, the trip sooner, um, which I'm thankful for. It's been beautiful here. The sun's out. So it lifts the spirits up a little bit. Yeah. I mean, with everything going on, it's been... Uh... Intense to say the least. So glad that you know you got out of the city. Um, we're over here in Venice, and it's been uh, it's been a lot, but we're staying positive and you know Good. just hop into it. Um, Absolutely. So you know, number one, thanks again for making the time. Um, for those that don't know, uh, guys, this is episode five with uh, Ashley Thompson, uh, CEO and co-founder of Mush, one of my favorite personal food and beverage brands in the space, and also Ashley is. Is, a, is an absolute rock star and so impressive. So excited to have you on today. Thank you. Very kind of you. You are as well. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, well, let's look. want to keep it super casual. I actually, this morning, um, lucky that, that Josh picked me up some fantastic wild <laughs> blueberry. You've come prepared. Mush. So I'm going to be eating a little bit of, uh, of your product today while we're chatting, but um, just honestly, wanna on a high level, just wanna hear a little bit about you and, and, and how did this even kick off? Like where 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 do we begin? Gosh, um, where do we even begin? So um I've always I guess had a, a passion for health and wellness. My older sister, when I was I think I was ten years old, she was diagnosed with type one diabetes. And that completely changed our entire world. And that was really the first time I became enlightened to this idea that what you eat affects how you feel and how you function. Um, so this connection, this deep connection between food and how you feel, think and do. And I kind of took that to an extreme and just pursued um, knowledge um, and experimented with with food throughout my entire adolescence thereafter to understand what what types of foods are healthy, what what aren't, um, and so that that kind of was the the beginning of the journey. Um, and then later on in life, um, when I was working in finance, um, realized that my my passion really wasn't in. Uh, the the zero sum <laughs> game of finance, and that it really um, w lied in the fact that I wanted to help people um, through through putting out and creating a product like this. So that's kind of the backstory all so, over the place. So, so, no, so back to like your finance days because I can really relate to that. You know, you're sitting in your cubicle and your meals are so structured, and you're eating out probably almost every day unless you meal prep, which with what time. Right. Um, so, you know, was, was there an aha moment? Like, first off, are you a big consumer of overnight oats already? Like, was, where, where did that kind of segue? Yeah. 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 That? Good, good question. So I was an avid runner. Well, I guess it starts again, back from childhood. I was a cereal lover. So before I knew that cereal was highly processed, probably not the best. What was your favorite cereal? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I loved them all. I loved anything from like, you know, shredded wheat, like plain shredded wheat to Fruit Loops. I mean, I was- Or I Cookie would, Crisp or oh, um, anyway. Fruity Pebbles. Fruity, Unbelievable. oh my gosh. <laughs> and I loved, so I loved soggy cereal. Okay. I love mushy texture. Um, I've always had an affinity for it. And what I would do when I was younger is I would soak my cereal overnight not oats, just any type of cereal overnight. And I would have it for breakfast in the morning. I was super type A, wanted, wanted to be squared away when I woke up. Um, and that's so I kind of 
and then as my knowledge of nutrition evolved and, um, and grew, I realized, okay, I probably shouldn't be soaking, you know, fruity pebbles overnight in chocolate milk or whatever it was. I should be soaking oats, oatmeal, super satiating, super healthy, super heart healthy, um, uh, overnight. Um, and I started doing that and bringing it into work, uh, uh, in finance isn't um, it wild how that child how that childhood nostalgia something you did as a kid is like it translates so powerfully through into your final product i can oh, by the way i can relate to that so well because i'm a huge i have a huge sweet tooth and i eat tons of popsicles and ice cream products i like sweets and snacks and um yeah I, it's it's amazing for you to even share that and how that's translated to mush it's in the name so that's really yep. cool yep. <laughs> And my dad, so the name actually is derived from, um, it's a, it's an ode to my father who would always ask me, Hey, what's in your mush this morning? Cause I would always have some weird concoction so of awesome. soggy cereal. And I thought I, my father's a huge role model in my life. So I thought, why not? Um, and it's, it's a fun polarizing short one syllable type of name, which I like. Definitely, <laughs> definitely, definitely. Okay. So let's, yeah. let's go, let's go back to, uh, you're, you're working at Goldman uh, you know, working hard. What what exactly were you doing there? And did you have a moment in that sli a li life cycle of, of, of your career there where you were kind of fed up and were ready to make this big transition? Yeah. Um, so I was a trader in fixed income. Um, I traded, um, I was an analyst on a trading desk for non-agency um, asset-backed security funding, which is really what we, we were uh, leveraging up hedge fund portfolios full of asset backed security. So a lot of the stuff that blew up in 08. Um, and, I, you know, I actually really enjoyed my time there. I really enjoyed the learning curve. I enjoyed the intensity. I enjoyed the people around me. Um, I had some great mentors um, and it really toughened me up. Um, in a lot of ways, uh, which bodes well for, for the path that I chose, uh, that is entrepreneurship. And, um, but I, I just realized that in order to be really successful, um, which I wanted to be in anything that I do, um, you really have to, the edge has to be in your passion. And I just recognized early on that I wasn't obsessed with the markets. Like, you know, the guy to the left of me or the woman to the right of me, like they were. And, um, and so I knew I, I probably with this kind of in, intensity would not survive tens of years if I don't really love it. And um, so I had just gotten my third bonus. And that's how they keep you in by paying you really well, right? Oh, yeah. And yep. I was like, gosh, if I if I say I'm only going to do it one more year for one more bonus, um, I'm probably going to be here for the next however many years. I'm not going to be passionate. It's going to be terrible. I'm not going to live the life that I want to live. I, I got to do something about it. So um, I got that money. And then when I, I, I was toying around with these ideas, I felt comfortable with the money that I had in the bank account that I could really go out and do something and not depend on anyone but myself to, to do it. Um, and that's kind of when I took the leap of faith. It's so it's so amazing because I had such a similar experience in investment banking. Um, when I, I just remember there was one weekend specifically, I was on year four and I was in a very similar uh, situation as you where, you know, the pay was good. It was a stable career. Um, but I just knew deep down, like really in my gut that um, there's no way that I was going to be able to show up consistently and work those hours and work those late nights and weekends. If this wasn't something that was what I felt like a calling or something I loved or was incredibly passionate about or really had a mission um, to do. And, totally. Uh, it, you, you hit that breaking point and then it's, and then it's, you know, it gets really challenging. I feel like every year is more and more difficult to, uh, to make a, a, you know, a leap or some sort of a pivot. So uh, totally. really, really resonate with that. And, and I guess, you know, moving on to that, so you you were you you were making basically a beta version of Mush at work every day, correct? Yep. Okay. And exactly. were you bringing in like a mason jar or like what were you bringing? Yeah. In? So I I would yeah I would bring it in like a or a Tupperware know, re reusable Tupperware. Yep. Um, 
Or I would, I would eat hot oatmeal, but, um, it was so bland. I actually had a canister of oats in my, in my filing cabinet next to my desk and would, would go to the tea point in the pantry on the floor and get some hot water. But like, talk about bland and, and awful. And uh, once it got cold and sticky, I, I never really <laughs> enjoyed it. So, yeah. um, it was a treat when I, when I brought it in myself, but yeah, it was bringing it in. People are like, what are you eating? Like, what is that cold oatmeal? Like so unfamiliar. Um, is there something about oatmeal? Like why oats? Like what makes that product? And by the way, oats are having a bit of a moment. They've been huge for a while, but lately yeah. a lot of people have been transitioning to oat milk, oat alternatives. Why oats for you? Oats. Okay. So first of all, they're, it's like, I don't, I don't necessarily believe in like superfoods, but talk about, I love nutrient dense foods, like bang for your buck. If you're going to have this calorie, let it, let it have great macronutrient profile to it so that it can fuel you for whatever it is that you want to do or whatever it is that you are doing. And so oats are super uh, nutrient dense great macronutrient profile, carbs, protein, and fat. Um, they're satiating. They're, they're, bl they're like a great base to their bland base that you can then mix with other things and really create something special. And I love that. It's like such a sleepy ingredient. Like when you think of oats, you think of Quaker, how, how sleepy and uh, how, I mean, Quaker doesn't resonate with today's consumer. So I knew like, hey, there's like, there's kind of this gap here that we could, you know, insert ourselves into and bring about this like familiar ingredient, familiar breakfast item and put a novel spin to it. Did Quaker um, ever launch a refrigerator? Has have there been any other no. companies that, why? Like, Not and, 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 and I tried the well, Quaker oat milk at like, I think Expo three years ago and oh my yep. God. And we it's won't gone. get started. <laughs> it's gone. Yeah. And it's gone off the market. No, you know, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why. Um, but refrigeration, so Quaker, most of their items, I mean, all of their items are, are shelf stable. Um, they don't do refrigerated uh, items. So I think that's part of it, like leveraging their own, you know, their current infrastructure is a, a huge part of the strategics um, plan for innovation. Um, and, and why innovate when you have all the distribution in the world, you got the marketing dollars and you know, that's, that's what these big guys think. I mean, that's not the right answer, but yeah. And the margin, the margin on, on just a canister of oats, I mean, they, they actually crush it. So they don't really need to innovate because the product kind of works got um, it. and they have great market share. Um, so yeah, they, they it. haven't, they, they came out with a shelf stable version and I think that's even been reduced some not because it hasn't been working but because um of probably the margin profile got it got it okay so understand now it makes complete sense i guess something that i personally would love to know because this is one of my biggest challenges you have this incredible career you're working at goldman sachs i mean talk about pedigree and success and what you had been working in college to attain and, and you know you have this great situation um now you are working on this, this, what a lot of people might think, okay, this wild kind of out there oat <laughs> idea. How yes. do you go from a fantastic pedigree career to jumping into something where I can only imagine, cause I dealt with it, you know, being the wild person who's going to quit their job and sell oatmeal um, and deal with the opinion, the anxiety, the, the fear, the, you know, the unknown. How do you, how do you go about that? Yeah. How do you cope? Um, I think the first, the first thing is that I just like wholeheartedly believed in this product and, and what I wanted to do. Um, like I, I, I was like obsessive about it and I, I knew that it was going to work and I was going to figure out how it was going to work. So all of the naysayers, like I kind of just like, I knew early on, like not everyone is going to understand this concept right away because people don't even know what cold overnight oats are. Um, but I for sure know that it's a solution to one of my own problems and it's a problem that a lot of folks have. So it's going to work. So that was part of it. Like just the passion and energy behind it carried me through a lot of the anxiety, fear, negativity. Um, you know, that were there people that were like, Ashley, how could you quit your, how, like, I don't know, like when you were, yeah. working, like, how yeah. could you do this? And, and, mean, and what I did remember... you respond to them? 
Yeah, I remember talking to one person specifically, very senior person at the firm, um, telling telling her that I uh, was leaving to start this oatmeal business, and I was going to move to Southern California and, and start R and Ding in in farmers markets. And like the look on her face, like I'll just never forget it. Was just like you've got to be kidding me. Like you're an analyst on our trading floor and you're going to go sell cold oatmeal. Like it was, it was like so apparent that there was just a ton of confusion and a gap um, between my vision and what she could perceive as a, a, a good reality for me. But um, yeah, there were, there was a lot of that, but um, the passion and then uh, two, my father's an entrepreneur and he couldn't have been more supportive. I mean, like every step of the way, like, yes, you can do this. Yes, it's a good idea. No, that recipe is gross. But yes, if you improve it, it'll be good. <laughs> like super transparent, but just so, so, so supportive. I think that helped. And then a lot of my friends, other friends and family, my fiance, my my former business partner at the time, um, just so supportive, like, go for it. What, what, what do you have to lose at 24? I was 24 years old. You can't really make a mistake before you're 30. Um, so I had six years to kind of, <laughs> in my did mind, you, figure did, it out. Did a part, so I, I had the same exact thought process. I said, okay, I'm 25. I've got, you know, five years to really, can this, will this work? Is there anything here? If I'm going to bet on myself now is the time. Did you also have that fear that the biggest risk you were taking was not taking the risk. Cause that was what kind of made, did it for me was if I look back and I didn't do this and someone else does it, or just, it never is realized. That's actually what was my biggest fear, which was like the ultimate uh, for decision maker. For sure. Like not realizing your potential. Like you have this like creativity and dream bottled up inside, right? Like dream pops, like you have this dream and then you just don't do it because of like what, like stupid, societal norms like I you know that that was for sure a huge huge part of it um I'm a big believer uh in the saying don't die wondering like it's great I love that yeah don't die wondering that is that will be the worst thing that you can do um so I don't I just kind of you got to be like a, a man or woman of action and just go for it so that that's that's awesome I think also another thing that's really uh interesting is um, a lot of people I'll talk to that want to start businesses. Um, my my dad is also my mom and dad are both entrepreneurs as well. So I think when you're surrounded by people who celebrate that, um, it yeah. makes it a little bit easier to make the leap of faith. Versus if you're uh, people who are conflicted with with their parents who aren't celebrating that type of a decision, I think that's an even bigger challenge that I can't relate to. Um, yeah. But I find it interesting. Um, so awesome. Um, so okay. So. Amazing. Let's let's talk about you just quit. You're selling Moshe at farmers markets. You were in San Diego, correct? Yeah. Um, you know, you, you and your business partner, you're out there, you're you're selling selling oatmeal. Um, what 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 starts to happen over the next year or twelve to eighteen months? Gosh. Um a were lot you, of were you guys like making of, where were you making it by the way? So because our product is not baked and it didn't have a kill like what we call a kill step. Um, in the food industry, um, some sort of pasteurization technique to it, we couldn't um, like like heat, like baking something, we couldn't make it at home. So we off the bat had to find a place to make it that was sort of like certified by the county and state to be like a a food facility in in California. Um, So we found that um, is actually a a woman making paleo bars. She's crushing it right now. Um, she, she's wonderful. She allowed us to rent like a table in her big manufacturing facility. Awesome. We could come in for certain hours of the day, certain days of the week. Um, and just like mix up in literally like what would be like a big salad bowl <laughs> in, that you'd find in some chef's kitchen. Um, these, these overnight oats. And I remember the first, uh, the first version had yogurt in it and people were like, yuck. Like there was like this aversion to yogurt with oats um, that we met in the farmer's market. So we knew immediately, okay, maybe, maybe this should be dairy free. It should be uh, a plant-based item. And we kind of like every step of the way, just listened to customers as we went to these farmer's markets um, and got feedback, uh, 
understood what flavor profiles people were looking for, what resonated with folks, what kind of pack form would work. Um, and the biggest barrier we had in the first 12 months was extending the shelf life. So the, the shelf life of the product was seven days. That's um, crazy. It was insane. That's insane. <laughs> it, it was insane. I mean, we had so many. So if issues. you didn't sell it at the farmer's market that weekend, then you're done, right? Like, it was done. So we got creative and we yeah. started, we, we were like, okay, we can't keep, it's hard. Uh, it was hard for us to predict how much we would sell. It was very volatile or variable. And so when we did have excess inventory, um, we started to bake it into muffins and sell the muffins on the side too. Um, just knowing that awesome. we didn't really want to get into muffins, but we didn't want to waste the product. So we would bake it. That would preserve it for a little while longer. And actually people love the friggin' muffins. I'm like, maybe we should bring them back. Who knows? <laughs> so awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you guys are hitting farmer's markets and then Hard. how did you guys get into your first, I read, I read you guys the first, first place you launched was Whole Foods, correct? Yep. 10, What's, 10 what stores. Was, what was the story there? Oh my gosh. So I, so I was at a demo at a, a coffee, a local coffee shop and, um, they they brought in a bunch of brands to demo the product. It was the opening of like their third location in San Diego. And, and were you I, guys in this container then or no? No, we were in like a little souffle cup, like something that you would get at like a takeout restaurant <laughs> filled with like dressing or something like so like, awesome. yeah, archaic. Um, and it was, we bought them from webstaurant.com and we would like hand apply we would get, we would print stickers at uh, FedEx or whatever, and then hand apply the stickers to the cups. It was insane. No um, nutrition label. <laughs> no, that, I'm, that, that I'm came joking. later. It came later. No, but for a while. We, we did didn't. the same. We did the same thing. We, were, we had these little baggies that were awful and we would make stickers and post a sticker on the front, no nutrition label on the back and just boom, boom, boom. So Who I get it. nutrition <laughs> anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, we were like, just try it. Just try yeah. it. Yeah. It's awesome. Um, yeah. Where was I? Uh, oh, Whole Foods. Yeah, Whole Foods. So um, we finally, so we, we finally figure out how to extend the shelf life through HPP, which is a really wonderful technology um, that's predominantly used to preserve or extend the shelf life of meats, guacamoles, things of that nature. Um, we were one of the first to put oatmeal through through H or uh, undergo HPP, which is really cool. Um, and so once we figured that out, then we got that container. Um, we, I, I met, um, well, let me back up. So I, I meet this guy at this coffee shop demoing the product and they were the, the product that he was demoing was in whole foods. And I was like, Oh, how'd you, how'd you guys like any tips for getting into whole foods? Like the, the typical question that you ask when yeah. you're first starting out your business, you want to get into like the Mecca of, of the grocery stores. And um, he's like, yeah, I know a guy, his name is blah, blah, blah. And I look him up and he's like the head of the region in SOPAC. And I friend him on LinkedIn. There you go. LinkedIn. So friend him on LinkedIn, but I don't reach out until because we didn't have the packaging at the time right. then six months later we finally have the packaging we put it up we put up this horrific website with like it was one landing page with this friggin' product that had terrible artwork on it and i reach out to the guy don't hear back from him the guy on linkedin um don't hear back from him and then a few days later uh the local forager of whole foods reaches out and said hey i i found your product would love to give it a try um she's wonderful um it really i mean i credit her um a lot to our our success and and launching there she was so she's been so supportive of the brand since day one um so we 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 meet with her we get in we launch in 10 whole food stores three months later because we had to figure out how do we even do this um yep. <laughs> we totally don't know how to do this <laughs> Haven't you yeah. noticed there are these moments where you have no idea, you just set a deadline and you're yeah. like, we're going to fix, and you, you'd be shocked what you can kind of, uh, what you can accomplish when there's a hard deadline and yeah. you just, you don't have a choice. <laughs> yeah. Like there, we were going to figure it out one way or another. Like yeah. it, 
it was a mess, a total mess, but we got it done. I don't even know how the product was like edible right. by the time it got to the shelf, but it was and it worked and it was fine. And and so you guys, you know, I've I've been following you guys for a while. You were doing direct to consumer then or just retail then? Uh just retail, no direct right. to consumer. And then, you know, progressed into I know you guys were on Shark Tank. Was that soon thereafter or was that a lot farther off? Um, so we get into Whole Foods March of twenty seventeen. Then we uh the executive producer found our product at Whole Foods loved it reached out we awesome. get an interview with whole foods th or with shark tank three months later we're filming a month thereafter and then we air that november so we were in from march to november and we air in november and that's when we launched we launched direct to consumer site the night of the shark tank airing not oh ever God. having shipped a single refrigerated pack in the history of the company let me tell you what ensued was nothing less than chaos. <laughs> it was wild. Um, we were shipping orders that we had received the following like five days uh, post shark. Tank. Yeah. The following days after shark tank, we didn't finish shipping until March of the following year. And so, in that moment November. you're panicking. You think the world's over. We have oh, like over it's done. We're done. Ruined it. Done. But you look back and you're like, man, I was able to power through this. It was no big deal. It's fine. Boom. Here we are. I, I feel like yep. that's another thing is, is, is just realizing in the moment, these things that seem like absolute disasters um, can end up just, you know, you can drop in the, in the cup. So. Yeah. Like another, another quote I live by. I love quotes. I, I tell everyone when, when I'm interviewing that I love quotes and I really do. Um, but one that resonates here is the outcome is not the outcome. Like this idea that like, Great just quote. because this happened, it doesn't mean that that's the ending and that there's nothing thereafter, like something else will then come. So just, uh, you have to ground yourself in that reality. The outcome is not the outcome awesome yeah i love it i love yeah. it yeah so okay that that was uh 2017 2018 ish 2017 yeah yep into 2018 okay. yeah and and where is mush now i mean i know you guys are everywhere but how is how has the business evolved from that experience uh to where you are today yeah so um we're in a lot more doors um you know after shark tank we we started to uh, we developed a, a good direct to consumer business, which is great. But then we also expanded into other regions and other parts of the country um, through our, our DSD network or direct store distributors um, who help us get into, you know, the coffee shops, the cafes, the athletic clubs, um, really great, really wonderful partners um, for our business. And, and then started to uh, tackle Whole Foods region by region. Um, and then branch out into other grocery chains in the regions that we were that we had some coverage in. Um, so now we're we're national at Whole Foods. Uh, we're launching next week uh, in all of Sprouts, which is amazing. Congratulations! Um, That's a big thank win. Thank you. Yeah, big win in the natural space. Um, we're in a lot of the the higher end conventional grocery chains like Publix and Wegmans, Meyer. Um, we're in a lot of the natural food chains, the mom and pops. Um, we, uh, we've been in Costco this year, which is incredible. Um, so yeah, lots of, lots of distribution growth. Um, it, it, it's, it's been incredible. I would say, and with respect to the business, the biggest evolution um, internally has been this, um, this shift from like super product focused, like, product, 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 making the best product, how do we evolve for uh, the product to be the best product, best ingredients, best pricing, best packaging, best everything from a product perspective so that we're delivering value to the consumers to how do we execute this vision of getting this product everywhere? So it's transitioned from product focus to team focus, um, not forgetting about the product, obviously product is always first and foremost foremost that it's just such an important part in cpg um but now uh really focus on on our team internally that's been a, a huge priority of mine to recruit 
hire um, and uh, mentor to the extent that I can um, the folks on my team, help them buy into the mission that we have, um, the, the purpose that we have. Um, yeah, it's been really fun, but a, a huge learning curve for me. And I think you look at kind of where you were on the earlier stages of the business where you're wearing every hat and now you've really transitioned to kind of being this conductor. Um, yep. And, and so I guess that role shift, how has that been for you? Has it been a challenge because you typically like to be so involved for me personally, that's one of my biggest challenges is I like to be involved in everything. And I've had to find myself taking a little bit of a step back and passing things on. So is that, how, how did you go about that? Yeah. Um, it's really, really, really tough. Not because I don't want to delegate, but because I didn't have like a mental picture of what delegation looked like. Like I didn't even know what I was supposed to be doing conducting. So, um, like you're, you're just like, as an entrepreneur, you're such a doer. Like it's your first instinct is to just do. (laughs) And as a, quote unquote CEO or a leader, your, your, your job is to serve, not to do. It's to serve those around you so that they can do. Um, and You've said that to me on a couple calls and it's, it's, it's powerful. It's really yeah, important. Yeah. It's like you need to empower people to do their job really well. And that's not, you can't do that by doing it for them. So you have to just completely shift your, your mental state um, and like your workflow, like, what does that look like from a workflow perspective? Like you're, you're not, you're not, uh, necessarily making those calls or writing those emails or putting those decks together. You're now thinking about how do I empower my director of finance, um, with the knowledge and tools, um, and resources to do his job effectively. How do I empower my head of supply chain to cross collaborate with my VP of sales in a great way that works well for both of them. How do we grapple with different personalities, different types of effectiveness in the workplace? It's just, it's a whole different beast. It goes from, you know, slinging oatmeal at the farmer's market to um, it's EQ. It's, it's yeah, really, it's, it's, it's all it's, EQ. It's all it's EQ. awesome. Yeah. It's awesome. Which, which I'm not wonderful at like EQ is probably, you know, I majored in math, like, I'm hardcore, like love to think, analyze, problem solve. I was never, I, you know, wasn't on a ton of team, team sports, um, was always a, you know, runner, like just such an individual contributor with an individual contributor's mindset. And that is an, that's the antithesis of what you need to do and be, um, as a leader of an organization. I I think that's a great segue into like my next question for you is, like, you know, it's fantastic that you have a background in finance. And I know a lot of founders that don't. And I think, to be honest, I'm lucky that, that I had that experience as well. But, um, you know, these businesses are really capital intensive. Like to, to be a contender in CPG, you need to understand how to access capital the right way. You need to understand how to allocate that capital. And you need to understand your unit economics and, and really what the business looks like beyond product brand marketing. And so my question to you is what advice or, you know, how did you think about selecting your investors, raising capital and scaling your business without giving away the house and also being really capital efficient? Yeah, such great questions. I have so many thoughts on this. Um, I would say um, in the beginning, I just didn't want to, I wanted to learn as much as I could. And I knew, I I also knew that I wasn't prepared to handle other people's money. Like I just wasn't ready to spend tens of thousands of dollars of someone else's money, not knowing what the hell I was doing as an entrepreneur. So I didn't let myself, like we didn't raise money. We said, we're, we're going to put our money where our mouth is and we're going to put our own money into it. That pressure, which I love, I love pressure um, that pressure will undoubtedly breed, um, work ethic and creativity, financial constraints, breed creativity. I'm a big believer in that. And I, I knew that, um, even then. Um, so in the beginning I was like, so opposed to raising money. And also like, you just like at 24, you don't know, you don't know anything. And like, trust is a big thing with me. Like I have a hard time trusting people. So I just didn't trust anyone. I was like, 
this is my dream. I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know where it's going to go. I know it's going to be big. I don't know where it's going to go. But I don't want anyone else telling me, like, what I need to do. Like, let me figure this out for a little bit. And then once I started to understand, like, how to get things done, where this could go, um, how, like, what the unit economics look like. Like, I got my feet wet in all of it. I was much more comfortable to say, like, okay, we need some money, but not a lot. Like, we're the, the market's not even ready for cold oatmeal right now. Like, this still needs to mature for a couple of years. Like, we don't need $5 million right out of the gate. Um, let's dip our toes in an investor relationship and let's see how it goes. So we, we raised, um, a little bit of money from Mark Cuban, uh, from Shark Tank. Um, and, and we, you know, we got our feet wet in what it, what it's like to raise money from an investor and that relationship and the dynamic and everything. And, um, thankfully Mark is just so incredible um, he is founder friendly and like a total operator. Like I, I tell everyone I've been to the Mark Cuban school of business and I really have, he, he's phenomenal. Um, I was, I was watching an interview with him recently, um, where he talks about when he had just bought the maps and he created season yeah. ticket, uh, yep. the season ticket holder system and that yep. he was individually calling his season yeah. ticket holders to, to win them yeah. over. Like what the owner guy... of a basketball team does that? <laughs> Because he, like, awesome. he is not afraid of work. And, like, he is the biggest believer in, like, the grassroots approach, which is, I think, what really resonated uh, with him and, and us is that a bunch of money. And we, uh... yo, yeah. Did Actually, I, I got out? a phone call. My bad. Oh, no worries. Um, life happens. Yep. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it, our, our approach to the way we were doing things like this grassroots approach, like let's talk to the people who are going to be buying it at the farmer's markets. Let's start small. Let's figure things out. What works, what doesn't do more of what works and less of what doesn't he, he's all about that. So really great partnership. Um, but again, like I, I still just felt like, gosh, I, I don't, I don't know enough to like, I don't know how to spend millions of dollars. Like I, I can't even conceptualize that. Like this thing makes money already. We just need to keep going. Like just yeah. keep going. And like, I, I'm not going to lie. I, I do love control. Um, I do love having power and I, I love not having to answer to anyone really when it comes to the business. Um, so I've tried to keep it that way for a very you know, very long time. And thankfully I still have that kind of autonomy. Um, and then we, we raised again, um, uh, for a number of reasons. Um, but again, not a huge round, but, uh, we brought in some wonderful, um, partners in Peter Rahal, Jared Smith and Sam McBride from, from RX bar. Um, they're just like, again, founder friendly operator, like, roll up your sleeves type of guys. Um, and those are the types of folks that I, I love to work with. They, their, their values just resonate with my own. Their incentives are aligned with my own. And I feel like that's often not the case in venture capital, especially with CPG. There's too much money flowing into CPG um, in venture, from venture capital. Like brands should only be as big as the, the, um, the organic growth that makes them that size they shouldn't it's really bad to subsidize consumer products um from my perspective and that's what you're seeing a lot of so it, you're it, so much and especially now with you know what's what's happening in, in you know the economy effectively you have these businesses that are they've raised at far too high valuations they've basically inflated their valuations they're running out of cash they have way too many expenditures the business doesn't merit maybe even being a venture-backed business and it's sad because it's just, it's not sustainable. Um, but, yep. you know, I, I, I will say I really commend you on your, because I, I feel the same way. I think actually if I had gotten million, like a $5 million check to start the business, we would have been out of business in 12 months because I had no idea what we were, like we had no clue. You were doing direct to consumer, you're testing. It's so critical in that early stage of that business that you iterate, you test, you tweak, and you find product market fit. Versus totally. being so 
arrogant to think that I have an amazing idea. This is going to work. I'm going to spend $5 million and it's going to explode in popularity. Right. It's just arrogance. Totally. I mean, and like, there is this idea, like fail quickly <clears throat> and I totally get that, but it, it like, what is failure or success? Like, Maybe the success is just the journey that you've been on in trying to build this thing and what you learn about yourself along the way. Like, it, it's not a number, you know? So I, very I don't, real. I think that that's a short sighted way of looking at entrepreneurship. Um, so, yeah, what even, if, so even if you're a serial entrepreneur. So that's an amazing point too, is like, what, like what, what, what's the, what's your, what's your mission? What do you, what do you want to accomplish here? Obviously it's amazing to have, to be successful from a financial standpoint, to build a, a you know, a, a business that is, is your legacy and associated with your legacy. But what is that for you? What do you want to really achieve via your vehicle of, of mush um, moving forward? Yeah. I mean, so I really, again, back to like why I started, I'm super passionate about health and wellness I'm passionate about the the epidemics that we the health epidemics that we have in the United States and really passionate about mental wellness um, and the connection between what you eat and, and how you think and feel. And so um, our mission uh, as a business is just to help people feel, think and do better by uh, by offering healthy items that are convenient and accessible so that you can consume more of them um, and thus hopefully feel better. Um, that That's really the mission, to be like a, a really wonderful brand that people trust, um, a brand that fuels people to do positive things in the world and have a positive impact in the world. I think there are too many, too many companies out there that are, um, uh, you know, profit focused, bottom line focused always. And I just, uh, I just don't think that that's going to move. Uh, it doesn't move the needle. And I don't think it will, will move the needle, especially nowadays. I think it's ever important to be purpose driven. So and it's, it's the same argument uh, you made back at Goldman and in, in finance. If you're not truly like this is so hard and so competitive that if there isn't a greater why you're going to get tired, burnt out in your, oh, your yeah, it's not going to like, People who are chasing that quick exit, good luck. This is not the industry to do it. No. It's so competitive. Prob like the probability, it's, it's just not. Like, it, you know? Oh, yeah. No. I'm not like we like it's been five and a half years. Like I make and sell oatmeal. Like you have to have a purpose behind it's it badass. to keep you going. Badass. You know? Yeah. No, you, you really you really do, though. Like what gets you up in the morning? Like what gets me up in the morning is the fact that like every time I hear a customer say like, well, I have high cholesterol and now I eat mush every day and my cholesterol has gone down and like I attribute it to your product. I'm like, fuck yeah. Like that's why we're doing what we're doing. We're helping awesome. that person live a better life. And, um, you know, we're hopefully leaving the planet better off than, than how we found it. And that's something that my parents have always kind of instilled in me. Um, there's a lot of altruism in my house so yeah it it's gets awesome. me gets me up every day <laughs> like I, I really resonate with it um it's 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 awesome powerful um amazing well ashley i am really appreciative thank you so much for for coming on i think Absolutely. your story is is really inspiring and uh i'm gonna continue supporting and eating more mush is there anything that we should you know keep keep our eyes out for as mush continues to evolve and develop over the next few years um, gosh, uh, keep your eye out for our new pack form coming to a Sprouts near you. Um, it's, it's taking a little bit of a different shape, which we're really excited about. So stay tuned. Um, we'll be announcing it soon. You are the best, Ashley. Congratulations on everything and, uh, excited awesome. to continue seeing your success. So, oh, same for you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, looking forward to chatting again soon. Awesome. Have a great weekend, Ashley. Talk you soon. You too. Take care, guys.